Hey everyone, what's going on? Welcome to the latest episode of the Genesis Cloud Community's Q&A show, the show where we answer your pressing questions from the Genesis Online community. My name is Matt Lawson. I'm your online community manager. And today we're talking about SMS. We're trying to get this episode out real quick because the team is really busy getting ready for experience. So we're gonna record this with our new friend, Amanda, and we hope you enjoy it. Amanda, welcome to the show. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Hey, it's been a while since we've had a first time guest on. Um, kind of exciting for me. You and I met just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm actually curious to learn more about you. Tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do at Genesis. I love telling this part of the, my story is I was a Genesis customer prior to coming on to Genesis. Oh, very yep. So I was I was a Genesis program manager and I came over about a year and a half ago, 2023 20, in the fall. And it was, uh, it was thrown in the deep end for sure because of the, the carrier uh, deadlines and things like that. So it's only been a year and a half, but it's felt like a lifetime. I've gotten very familiar, very quick. I do all of our uh, registration submissions and compliance and communication in the inbox and try my best to develop communication, uh, meet with our customers and just really trying to get them onboarded and up and running as best we can. Cool. Um, and I know that's what led you to me. We've been talking about yeah. doing an SMS community um, just to kind of help you streamline some of those communications. And as a first effort, we thought it would be really great to do this video to give an overview of kind of what SMS is. Yeah. And in particular, you wanted to talk about um, some new guidelines that have come out. Is that correct? Yeah. So like I said, I've really been struggling with developing documentation and writing it all out because there's so many nuances with SMS. And I thought, my gosh, if I could just get on camera and talk about it and share this information with our customers, it's just the fastest way. And get this information out there as fast as possible because we just keep getting more and more guidelines coming at us that it's slowing down that communication process. Cool. Well, um, as of now, we're, you and I are still working on the community launch plan, but this video is definitely right. the first step of that. So anybody out there who's watching this, if you want to follow our progress on launching that SMS community, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always in the community. We can put you on a list so that you're notified when that SMS community is going live and we can keep you updated on our progress. Um, but for now, Amanda, what do you think? Yeah. Let's go ahead and hop in and start covering SMS. Yeah, let's do it. What is SMS? So I think we're all familiar with SMS because we use it every day with our, you know, close family and friends. But uh, now that it's become so popular, we, it's called A to P and P to P. So application to person and then person to person. So it, since Genesis is an application and it has a capability to send out a mass amount of text messages, there's a lot of restrictions and guidelines around it now because fraud has increased, spam, phishing, things like that. That's the biggest reason why these guidelines have increased is because of the capacity that that an application has to reach out to so many people. Cool. So to prep for this um, recording, I know I asked in the community if people had questions and you had a lot of questions that have come into you that we're considering yeah. frequently asked questions. And really with this recording more than anything, we kind of wanted to cover those. So um, Amanda, it sounds like one of the big questions that you inevitably get asked is what is the number one thing customers need to know about onboarding SMS? Yeah, so I would say I spend a majority of my day explaining this to our customers. And since it's been changing so much, uh, Paul and I, he's the director of SMS, we talk about how the carriers can move the gold post on us. And every time I want to kind of create documentation, put it in writing, something else changes. And I'm like, hold on. Um, but I think we've kind of met, we're at its peak because it's very similar now to short codes. And short codes always had the most restrictions and the most requirements to get up and running. And now we're pretty much in alignment with that. And it's difficult for customers because they used to be able to just purchase a number and use it right away. And they didn't, they didn't need anything from us. Uh, and last year, all that stopped abruptly. Abruptly, we got an, a date for 10 DLC that any unregistered number was going to be blocked. And then the same happened with TFNs. So now anytime a customer purchases a number, they have to fill out a registration form, request the registration form from us, fill it out and return it back to us. So the number one thing I can say that's needed and needs to be educated on is compliance. So how our customers are collecting opt-in, which is we call our call to action. And the carriers are really looking for the call to action to be as transparent as possible. So this includes the fee disclosure, which is message and data rates may apply the frequency disclosure, which is message frequency may vary. 
along with consent provided for SMS only, meaning it cannot be lumped in with calls, emails, automated dialers, pre-recorded messages. Consumers should have the right to be able to agree to a call or an email, but not a text message. That's part of the, the opt-in for SMS consent. But then they also look at their website where the privacy policy, they wanna make sure that they're not sharing consent with affiliates or third parties. So if a shared consent is necessary for a business, because we all work with vendors and third parties and affiliates, right? They just, they have to put in the company name in their privacy policy and hmm. why that vendor needs to be contacting or will be contacting them through SMS as well. Ah. Um, so also they're gonna view their website for the, the terms of service. That terms of service has to be SMS specific where they state the purpose for messaging, reply stop to opt out, reply help for more information and customer care contact information. We do have this in our resource center with examples as well. Okay. So um, those are a lot of requirements. Are they legal? They're not legal. And this is another, you know, big question that we get. There is legal components to it, but the CTA for opt-in is required by wireless carriers. The guidelines follow the CTIAA, the CTIA and the TCPA. So since fraud, spam, deceptive opt-in, harassment has increased through the SMS channels, wireless carriers do expect that all compliance requirements are met in order for them to improve. And since they are the, they do govern final approval, they get to permit who uses their product. And okay. they're just, they're trying to do a lot of consumer protection. And there's a lot of deceptive opt-in where, you know, there's a lot of fine print, or they're not very clear about how often they're gonna be messaging somebody or they have so many different numbers that they're messaging somebody from. So they just want us to be as transparent as possible. Okay, what are the guidelines for message content use cases? So it's a little twofold because the message content does contain the use case, right? So there are forbidden use cases that the carriers will not approve under any circumstance. And that is sex, hate, alcohol, firearms, uh, tobacco, gambling, cannabis, and third-party collections. Actually, even if they are obtaining compliant consent from consumers, they won't approve these use cases. And even if you get an approved uh, campaign, they are now monitoring the content after the approval. So something that I saw recently was a customer was put on, um, had gotten a violation for not sending reply stop to opt out in their initial text message out to their customers. Oh, wow. So that's another thing too, is that uh, the carriers, and there's different tiers of severity, they can abruptly shut down a program if they're not compliant. Um, other times they can put them on like a probation where they give them a couple weeks uh, to make those changes and get compliant and prove that they are doing so. So are, are there any kind of like upcoming changes that you're aware of? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yes, we are, we're just notified recently of the UK numbers having to be registered and any newly purchased number will require registration in May of 2024. And we are gonna be sending out information through email. So our customers should be checking their email for that communication. You know, if our email addresses are out of date and they don't get it, uh, we will also be putting that in our release notes that comes out on Wednesday mornings and in the partner newsletter as well, the UK numbers registering. Okay, interesting. So one of the things I was thinking about is, um, and it's because it just happened to me recently with a vendor, but what if customers are using their numbers for reasons other than like uh, campaign or customer facing? Like, like, are these requirements still necessary? Yes. Yes and no. So we actually have a lot of customers that do have those different types of use cases. And, and when I meet with, you know, our account team as well, I'm explaining, you know, I'm kind of always having the, the fighting the good fight and explaining and talking through these use cases. And, and Paul does a majority of the short codes or he does all the short codes and, and um, helps, uh, helps me with the short, the long codes, sorry, the 10 DLC and the TFNs. And we, we meet with them and we kind of go to bat for our customers. But the bottom line that we keep hearing is regardless of the use case, the use case, the call to action for consent is necessary and we do have to provide it. So we see dev accounts, we see internal employee communications, we see single use cases like two-factor authentication, we see SMS programs that are not live yet, and we also see customer initiated use cases. So it's customer initiated only, they don't even, they don't send out 
uh, outbound messages. So this often confuses our customers on how to provide opt-in when their use case is not customer facing. And there are various methods to collect opt-in. So a customer initiated, we just need to know how is that customer informed on your number? How are they even aware that they can initiate a conversation? Is it through marketing material? Is it on your website? Uh, does an agent provide that number for them? Uh, so that's that's how opt-in method would be given for customer initiated only. For programs that are not live yet, we just need to see a mock-up or a script or a flow of what it's going to look like okay. with all the compliant information. Okay. And then for dev and demo accounts, uh, we usually request that they put in formal writing that the, their technical account team or the personal mobile device end user will be initiating the first text uh, when they are doing the demo and test. Okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit about some upcoming changes. What are some of the recent changes that wireless carriers have uh, implemented that could impact Genesis customers? Yeah, so we're still trying to play catch up with the with the 10 DLC date that we got on August 31st of last year. You know, we still have customers that are reaching out to us saying, why isn't my number working or it used to work and now it's not. And we typically have to say that uh, they have to register their number, which requires them filling out a registration form that we send them and um, us submitting that information to the carrier. So again, that was August 31st of the 10 DLCs. And now if anybody purchases a new 10 dlc it will say pending so they will be aware that it's not working but any number that was purchased prior to this deadline of august 31st it would say active but the messages would be failed because the messages are ultimately failed at a carrier level but within genesis we, we put it as a pending status um, once they made that change so they weren't confused um that it was active <laughs> Um, okay. So we, we, we changed the status to say pending, and then once the carrier approves it, it, it changes to active. But if the number was purchased prior to the deadline, you know, 20, early 2023 and before that, it would say active. If it was never registered, it's, it's going to get blocked by the carrier. So they have to submit registration. And then same thing happened with the, ten, with the toll freeze on January 31st as well. So as of now, all U.S. sender types are not permitted to send any messages out to customers until the carriers have approved okay. their registration. Um, so a couple of questions that came in over email. Um, the first one kind of goes into what you're saying. You may have already answered it. So I think it'll play in nicely. What does it mean if a SMS number is showing as pending in the SMS inventory? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so if it's pending, it's because uh, they need to register their number. Right. So see yeah. previous answer. Yeah, see previous. <laughs> exactly. All right, cool. Um, another question that came in. What are the most common reasons a customer could experience outbound filtering or message failures? A little bit of see previous question, which is the number is not registered. Uh, another reason could be that they are messaging landlines and they aren't like doing a scrub list. I see that a lot. Uh, landlines and unreachable handsets or destinations. Hmm. That is another uh, high cause for uh, filtering. Another one could be the content. So if there's URLs going out, depending on the URL, especially Bitly URLs, um, those aren't permitted and those would most likely get filtered. But okay. ultimately, when it comes to content, other than the forbidden use cases that I gave you, sometimes it's just a little ambiguous. It could be if they're collecting social security numbers to verify who their customer is, they typically something like that, but they would just like put them on a temporary block immediately. If they, if they look like they're trying to collect a, a social security number. Um, so what we would do is we investigate and we would communicate with the carrier and say, hey, what's going on? Why is this being blocked? Here's the content. We'll have to give them multiple examples. The carrier will look into it and they'll decide that either this is against carrier guidelines, this is suspicious, we're not putting, you know, getting them up and running yet until you provide us more information or they'll look into it and they'll be like, okay, this was kind of like a, a false positive, they call it. And they'll release the, the lift, they'll lift the, the block and they'll be able to send messages again. But it, it's more so around things like personal identification information, URL, and any forbidden use case content. Okay. Um, I feel like this question um, that we have probably should have been covered in the intro. What should customers know about having voice and SMS capabilities? Okay, so if a customer wants to have voice and SMS on a Genesis Cloud number, they should purchase 
a Genesis Cloud voice number, and then we can easily add SMS to it. It's a little bit more of a difficult process to add voice to an SMS number, meaning if the number was purchased in the SMS inventory first, and then to add voice later, because we have to do a, a disconnect with SMS, and it's it's a whole process. So it's a lot easier if they just purchase a Genesis Cloud voice number and we add SMS. We could also add SMS to a voice number if the if the voice portion is with another carrier. They can keep their voice portion with their other carrier. If that number has live traffic, SMS traffic on it at that other carrier, and they're bringing it over to us, there is going to be an outage. And that could be anywhere from a few hours up to three days that the customer has to prepare for. And that is not anything that we can control or prevent. The losing carrier has a certain amount of time to give us permission to take the number. So they have to release it to us. And in the time that they release it to us and then we gain it and all the magic happens in the phone clouds and identities and changing, switching of the guards and things like that happen. And then I do my process. There is a downtime where SMS will kind of go into a black hole. So we can do our best to do this off hours, um, out of business hours and keep it as minimal as possible. But if a customer has live SMS traffic with another carrier and is bringing it over to Genesis, there could be, will be a brief outage. But again, to talk a little bit about voice, we could always add SMS to a voice number and there will be no voice outage. The only outage would be if there's currently live SMS traffic. All right, awesome. So I guess one question is, what should a customer do if they have a go live date for SMS? but their number hasn't been approved by the wireless carrier, is the best thing to just wait in that instance? Should they have not announced the go live date? What do you recommend? Yeah, yeah. yeah that exactly. I, I've been talking about this um, with, with my director, Paul, recently saying, I just, I don't think that customers should be setting go live dates until they have approval because yeah. it's so, so much of it is out of our hands. You know, if a customer submits a form to us and they're missing information, then it just really creates the snowball effect of us chasing them down and, and educating them and informing them and them having to do the due diligence because now there's more work into it, right? Like they have to go to their web team and they have to talk to their legal team and they have to work with peers and, and departments within their own company to get these things done. And sometimes it can take them a couple of weeks, a couple of days, months to get that information back to us because they have work to do. And then it's just in the in our inbox and it just kind of like I said, it snowballs. Whereas if they, they read our template, our email with the form, they educate themselves, they get all this stuff up and running prior to submitting the form to us. It's a lot to read, but it's it's pretty clear cut and it's, we provide examples. And once we have all the information we need and we submit it, really it really takes one to two weeks for the carrier to approve. Um, sometimes it can take less than a week if if everything looks good. But there really isn't much of an escalation process with the actual carriers themselves. So um, we're doing our best. Our volume has drastically increased. You know, all the numbers got blocked, right? They, like I said, they used to be able to just purchase a number and use it. But now a customer cannot purchase a number without having to come through us to do manual work. So it the workload just drastically <laughs> increased for us and the, the deadlines keep coming. So. Uh, like I said, I don't think that a, a deadline or a go live date should be set until they have approved numbers um, or um, they could also communicate with their account team, their TAM, CSM partners, submit a customer care ticket because they also have ways to communicate with us uh, internally as well. Okay. So you just talked about how, you know, a lot of these processes are new and a little bird told me off camera that your team has grown around 500% just in the past year. And mm -hmm. um, so you have a lot to work out in terms of like logistics and staffing at the top of the episode. Yeah. We mentioned, we're thinking about doing an online community, um, but in general, I guess maybe it'd be good while we're kind of in flux here to ask how can customers get more information or additional support um, from your team if they need it? Yeah, like I said, we are trying to, we are under no delusion that this is you know, not going as quick or the way that, you know, customers are like, or that we would like either, you know, we, we definitely have a desire to meet our customers needs, but we're often on the phone with our customers 
just jumping on calls, trying to educate them, I would say pretty frequently um, because we understand and we have empathy for these changes and want to do our best to help them. But it, it, it's kind of twofold, right? Like I, I refer to it as like going to the doctor's office when you're waiting in the waiting room, it's just like you're so fed up and you're waiting for so long. But once you get into the doctor's office and you just love your doctor, you have a good doctor and you're like, ah, oh, the weight wasn't that bad. But you know, it, it, it's tough because the wait is a little bit longer right now, but we are working on future uh, ideas on how to improve this process in various ways. So uh, we definitely plan to do that and are excited to do that just as much as our customers. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. Really appreciate you giving us this overview of SMS. And um, in the future, I hope we get to work on launching the community yeah. that we talked about. Yes. So. yes, that is definitely a big goal of mine. Awesome. Get that information out there to everybody so that they don't have to wait for us in the waiting room. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, Amanda, uh, I really appreciate, again, I appreciate your time. Anything you want to say before we wrap up here? No, I don't think so. Okay, perfect. That's it. Um, yeah. Well, in that case, I know I'm about to head to experience. I wish you were as well, um, but I'll give everybody there your best regards. And when we get back, you and I can start on that community. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks everybody for stopping by to watch the show. We'll see you next time.